Hello. How are Hello. we? I am going to go ahead and start recording, and we are going to get to work. We have a lot to cover today. Um, today is on selling new construction, and it's part of the series uh, that I've created here called What Are We Selling? or Know What We're Selling. And um, there's several facets of this that I want to make sure that uh, we're not going to be able to cover all today, but we are going to focus on more of the construction side of things so that you understand and can speak a little more intelligently when people are buying new construction, considering new construction, and what things do they need to, should you be mindful to and aware of so that you can give them some better advisement. And um, so we're gonna, we're gonna cover a lot today. If you have questions, put them in the chat, and uh, we're gonna make sure that, we, that, that, I, that I hit all those for certain. And um, I'm gonna do a bit of screen sharing here because we do have, uh, I have some things that I wanna, I wanna uh, show and share. And so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll just kick into it. So let me, uh, let me share screen. Before we get started, are there any specific questions that you have or you wanna make sure that we cover today? Anything in particular? All right. Okay. So I'm building today off of a, a couple of different um, a, a couple of different things that I've taught before, and and as I mentioned, I will be we will be doing another course on architectural styles, so you can learn more about what's the difference with the difference in architecture, and then we will be doing one on representing buyers in new construction. And one of the things that you need to consider as far as contrast conditions and contingencies. And so um, we will cover some of that here at the end today because I do want to give you some nuggets on that. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and let's see here. It's always fun to me when um, I go to share screen. And uh, let's see here. <laughs> I want to share the whole kitten caboodle. All right. Dealt with this last time. And um, it's interesting where it's letting me share a screen, but it's not letting me share the whole screen. Whereas I want to share the whole entire screen. So I might have to do it separately. I don't understand why that is. It's always interesting to me. It's, remember this happened to you, Rebecca, and it would only let you toggle between? All right. Can you all still see me and hear me okay? Excellent. Thank you. Sorry for that. It's um, I'm having a little bit of... There we go. Okay, so you can see my screen, new home construction representation. You can hear me okay? Thumbs up. Awesome, thank you. Okay, cool. So um, I want you to get, today I want you to get knowledge of some of the materials that are involved in this. And so obviously we know there's a lot of advantages to people buying new construction, but for many reasons, you know, they like everything is new, maintenance and repairs being minimal, builders warranty energy efficiencies, individual choices, and community amenities. Um, there's typically no haggling over conditions or repairs. There's flexibility sometimes, lender relationships. There's going to be pricing competition. You'll get one-year touch-ups and corrections. Um, but you need to understand, and we'll, we'll get some of, some of this in the, in the end of today, and I will be doing a separate course on representing buyers um, and some of the conditions you need to be mindful for in representing them. Today is more about um, going over materials, okay? So understanding what we are selling, okay? And so, um, so one of the things we wanna go through is what is the process of buying a home? Um, the things that the builder is going through to get land, right? There's so many ways to go about that, but you'll need to understand that um, you know, getting the land is, uh, obviously getting zoning and things like that is a really big process in, in, um, in building new construction. And so, so 
and they're doing such, they've got to do feasibility studies and platting and surveying. And so just when somebody purchases doesn't mean we can get to building right away. We've got to make sure that the land and all that is right. And so there are things that you'll hear sometimes called impact fees. And impact fees can are things that are taxes levied by the city to builders because a building new construction has an impact right on roads and services and potentially fire and police and things like that. That is the builder's job to typically pay for those and they need to disclose um, if they've paid any of those and what those look like. Um, I'm not going to get into the new construction of researching builders, but I really want to get into more of the specs and things to consider, okay, as, as far as uh, the, the construction aspect of that. And so I'm going to toggle between, I want to go through, um, and I have to stop my sharing and reshare because this thing is so silly. I apologize. All right. Can you see uh, my Zoom screen here? Let's. Okay. Can you see my screen that says uh, a step-by-step -step guide to home building? Excellent. Thank you. So here's kind of the basics of the home building process and what things you need to understand. So when you're preparing a construction site and pouring foundation, there's some choices and you'll see different uh, construction methods as far as a slab or a crawl or a basement. Okay, so uh, once they've acquired permits and they've got construction crews to level the site, obviously depending upon the type of home that you're going to build will determine what needs to be done. The most common construction in our area is built on a crawl space. Now, don't be, don't be confused that a crawl, you actually have to crawl. There are walk-in crawl spaces, but they typically dig out a big hole and they, then they dig trenches um, uh, and then and they pour concrete in there to put, put for, prepare what is called a footer, all right? And when they put up a footer, uh, they level the site and then they put up, they pour that and then they start building, adding building blocks, okay? And that is considered really the foundation. Depending upon if it's a full basement and the whole, the, it's all dug out, you have to plan for, um, uh, for plumbing, okay? So depending upon if you're a slab, you're going to pour a slab, they're going to form that up and they have to know where the drains are going to be, like all the drains, all the electrical plumbing, things like that that's going to go obviously in the con concrete. And this document, by the way, Understanding and Selling New Construction, this is, uh, I have links in here. This is on the, um, the shared drive. I'll put a, a, a link to this in the chat as well. Pull that up here. The screens are a little, got a little screen stuff going on here. Apologize for that. Okay, so that's a link to that so you can see what I'm referencing here. And I have some diagrams I'm gonna show you as well. Um, so pouring a footer and foundation is a really important piece of the process and understanding um, it, that is kind of when it really begins, but weather can be a factor in that, right? Because I mean, you can't pour concrete except at certain temperatures and um, there's considerations to that. But that is really determining the outside border of the house. Uh, let me see here. Okay, let's show this diagram. All right. No, sorry about that. Can you see my screen okay? Man, what is it with me today? I'm sorry about this. Okay. Ooh. All right, you can see the diagram. <laughs> Lots of thumbs up today. Great. Okay, good. So um, when building this, you've got to depend, depend upon if it's going to be a basement, you've got to consider waterproofing, right? So um, if it's going to be livable square footage, there's obviously they need to make, they need to prepare for waterproofing. And so they can do some different things with respect to the foundation walls to help that process. There's things that are gonna, we're gonna talk about French drains and, and drainage systems and sump pumps. So when you're building a basement, um, you need to account that water will come in. So be prepared if anybody's building or wants a basement, it's not 
not if, it's typically when water will get in. And so you want to have um, you want to have a, a stump pump, and they'll integrate that into a corner of of the space there. And typically that'll be a hole in the ground where there's other drainage systems below the the poured basement as well as in the walls that that take the water to that area. And then and then so it collects there, and then the sump pump is where it pumps it out um, into the proper drainage. When building a basement, you can do it a couple of different ways. You can use what's called poured wall construction, which is what you're seeing in this diagram here. Um, and there's rebar in that. And, and you'll also see cinder block construction. Cinder block construction, it's a much more porous material and you will see that typically used in what we call traditional crawl spaces, okay? Uh, in the crawl space, you'll see here, there's a polyurethane barrier mentioned here that you'll hear typically called a vapor barrier. A vapor barrier is put down in a crawl space to help minimize moisture and condensation that can form in your crawl space. Make sense? You'll see that on inspections a lot where you won't see, uh, where you won't see the, the, the vapor barrier was missing or got, there's debris in the crawl space and things like that. Once you pour your walls for your foundation, then you're gonna start the framing process. And when we start framing, uh, there's some different framing methods uh, that to consider as far as choices for people. There's some general terms that I think it's good to know, and that is what is like the difference in a floor joist. So a floor joist, after they put what's called um, a rim joist, the rim joist goes on top of the, the foundation here, is the floor joist. It's what you walk on, and then you would have floor decking, or what you'll hear see called subfloor. Okay, the floor joists are tied into joist hangers, and then you have a subfloor. One of the most popular subfloor materials is called Advantec. And Advantec looks like plywood, but it, it contains um, chemicals that, uh, and it's been treated to, con to be able to sustain getting wet. Because right now the house doesn't have a roof on it, right? So uh, typically you're gonna have like an open framing system and water is getting in and getting on on the uh, on the floor system or the, the subfloor. That's okay. Um, the goal is once a framing starts on a house, you want to get it what they call dried in as quickly as possible. Because when you're dried in, then obviously you're minimizing moisture on the wood, which is the goal. But understanding Advantech, it's a brand name, but it's a material of subfloor that can that can withstand getting wet and doesn't get brittle or weak. Um, in the building process. All right. Once you go through, there's an inspection stage after the foundation is built. So recognizing new construction, there are inspections at just about every stage of this process. So it does not go fast at all. Um, and so be, be mindful of that when working with buyers that they need to account for there being delays. It's not if, it's when you will have many, many, many delays uh, through this process. And so whatever the builder tells you, they might, a typical new build should, should take between six to eight months. I would prepare your buyer to add at least 30 to 60 days to that without question. Have them in a month to month lease or something of that nature. Okay, then we move into rough framing. So as, as we saw there, you know, we've got the foundation poured, we're gonna start framing the walls. And let's go back here. When we're framing walls, uh, you have some choices as far as, come back here. Um, you have some choices as far as framing styles. Typically, they're gonna just use, um, they're just gonna bring a drop of lumber package and it's gonna have the ceiling trusses or the roof trusses that are pre-built. And then it's gonna have a stack of lumber that's gonna be used to frame up the walls. There's another form, it's called palletized wall system. And that is where they build the walls offsite and they bring them there and they basically assemble the house almost like uh, an erector set or a mobile home. The benefit of using um, pre-constructed palletized wall systems is that they're built in a controlled environment. Therefore, the, the quality control is typically better than a crew running around 
with loose timber and just trying to get it up as fast as possible with nail guns, but that is the most popular. All right, so you can see in this diagram where my, where my mouse is, uh, they start building this on top of the, uh, the joist. So as, as I showed you in the last diagram, I'll show you here, you're gonna have, um, you're gonna have joists running along the floor and then they're gonna start framing on top of that. And I wanna show you this diagram just for a couple of key terms that I think are important here, right? So obviously these are, uh, you've got studs. Those are the vertical two by fours that run, um, that run vertical. Know that a two by four really isn't two inches by four inches. It's not quite exact there. When they rough, you're gonna see, you're gonna have a double top plate. Uh, that will be what the roof trusses where the second floor gets built upon. You'll have a bottom plate, and then in that is the studs, and then you'll see they start framing out doorways and windows. You need a little extra support above doors and windows, and that's called a header. And a header gives extra support because obviously there's no structural support inside here. And that's something to be mindful of when you're in, in, in um, sometimes people want to renovate or uh, their uh, old ranch and they'll say, hey, I want to blow out a wall between two rooms. And in doing such, they need to put in a header. And a header basically just disperses the weight between the two outside uh, studs. Makes sense? And you'll see that when they double it up like that, they call it a king stud. All right, so these are rough openings. Same thing with measuring windows. You're gonna have an opening. The, the bottom of the window is called the sill. The top is the header. Any questions on this? This is, I'm trying to give you just enough of what I feel is applicable knowledge that you would be using for uh, general real estate like that we're practicing. Make sense, Rebecca? Um, I had a question about um, the crawl space versus slab versus full basement. Um, yes. how, 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 the, how it's chosen, which one it's going to be. And yes. then the diff between the, um, what did you call it when the, uh, when the walls are basically prefabricated and then brought onto site? Yeah. Palletized. Uh, palletized. Um, what you said that there are benefits to that, but why might a builder choose not to do that? Ah, great, great questions. So let me, let me answer your questions regarding uh, the basement uh, first and foremost. Why, why do they choose uh, the, the basement, um, the foundation methods, okay? So uh, it typically has to do with geography, cost and client preference. And so basements are very popular in, in what I would say that the Midwest, uh, there's no earthquakes. So you will rarely see basements in the West Coast where there are earthquakes because that would be the most likely place for things to fall in on themselves. Um, basements are popular in the Midwest uh, and were places for you know bonus bonus rooms, if you will. Uh, they're they're difficult to build here because we have so much rock. So we don't see basements maybe as much in new construction now because of the expense to construct them because they hit rock and the, the amount of need for waterproofing. So basements are very likely gonna leak. It is probably the most expensive method of, or no, excuse me, it is the most expensive method of construction, subterranean, that a builder can do for a home. So it's very expensive footage to build because of the waterproofing and the potential rock and excavation. Uh, why would somebody choose a slab versus a crawl space? So uh, slab is typically cheaper. Um, the thing is, is slabs can crack. Uh, you don't have a safe place per se to go subterranean if there was a tornado, which is of concern in our area. So you could go in your crawl space uh, if it was, you know, maybe high enough for you to get into it with your family. And then, um, and people believe it kind of allows your home to breathe. It makes it a lot easier if you wanted to add electrical connections or modify plumbing in a crawl space versus a slab, because you actually have to chisel into the slab to make those, uh, make those modifications. Yeah, great question. Uh, you mentioned wall systems and framing. A builder, uh, 
sometimes those palletized wall systems, they're more expensive, but they can be, um, like I said, they do carry typically a bit of higher quality. Now, it is where you see them using prefabricated construction is typically in, um, in the roof trusses. And roof trusses are, uh, there's my picture here of my roof trusses. There we go. So a gable roof, this is a typical roof, you know, where you're gonna see a gable roof. There's other styles, but uh, in a pitched gable roof like this, you're gonna see ceiling joists. And um, a lot of times they'll, they'll purchase these prefabricated because it, it, it actually is construction. It's not that difficult to, to have these brought in offsite. Um, there's less involved in doing palletized wall systems. So trusses, um, Trusses most, most of the time are fabricated offsite and brought in as part of what's called a lumber package. So when building, the builder is going to put together, uh, they're going to outsource it to, let's say, Husky Lumber. Husky Lumber is going to look at the floor plan that was created by the architect, uh, architect and put together a lumber package. And that's the big stack of wood that you see dropped at the, at the job site with the address spray painted on the side. That should be all the lumber, including overage, that a, that a carpenter needs to frame the house. And framing a house goes very, very quickly. So, um, you know, once they get started, that house could be undercover, depending on its size, within a couple of days. It goes very, very, very quickly. Okay. Uh, other considerations as far as materials for building your walls and what you're going to, how you're going to um, choose to build your house. These links I have in there, but uh, timber framing of a home is the most common. Um, it's the most plentiful and it's low labor costs. Uh, it's uh, cost of framing a house about seven to sixteen dollars a foot. That's including materials and labor. I think those costs are a little higher now, based on lumber costs are literally about sixty to one hundred percent higher than they were. Okay, siding. There's some different siding choices when it comes to homes and. Um, I'm gonna come back to, to the siding and exterior, but um, these are, I, I have resources on that for you as well. Okay, so we are, we are above ground now, and we're gonna complete the rough framing, which is the floor systems, the walls, and the roof system, okay? Then we're gonna apply sheeting to uh, exterior walls or protective wrap. It's typically a material um, like what's called Tyvek, which is a brand name. And that is put over the plywood, or what you'll hear sometimes called the OSB, Oriented Strand Board. It's just another word for um, cheap wood that they put on the exterior of the home before they wrap it. Okay, so after the studs, uh, after the studs are up, go back to our diagram here. After the studs are up, then they're going to put plywood on the exterior of the house, and then we're going to wrap it in Tyvek. And that helps waterproof the home and add as a protective barrier known as a house wrap. You'll sometimes see that the, the builder's name might be listed on that. Any questions about uh, vapor barriers or exterior wrap? Okay. It did not used to be code in Nashville to have a wrap on a house. It is now. So uh, You'll sometimes see a foam board used as well as an extra insulary property. And um, that would be ideal if you have the decking, um, the OSB or plywood, then you have the foam board, then you would have the wrap. All right, then we move into rough plumbing and electrical. Um, this is what we call rough ins. All right, now you're going to have a frame inspection that has to pass and then they'll start rough ins. And typically you've got plumbing, electrical, and HVAC or mechanicals, okay? So once the shell is finished, as far as the, the, all the framing goes, then you start bringing in tradespeople that's gonna start running the, the rough-ins. And those things are pipes and wires, sewer lines and vents, water supply lines, bathtubs, they bring those in, and you'll see those typically set in place early, early on because they sometimes can't get them out without cutting them in half. They literally have to like put them in place because uh, sometimes they're, they're too large. Those are typically for built-in um, bathtubs because they need to know where the bathtub is exactly going to sit so they know where to tie the drain into. 
you can move the plumbing that's going to attach to a sink or to other things, but for the tub, they want it to be set in place when the rough ins start. And then we're also going to account for ductwork and HVAC. Um, this is when things start to get exciting for the buyers because they, they, um, they have likely selected where those things are going to go. Um, part of that is they need to select, um, uh, come back right to, I'm going to come back to insulation, go to my other diagram here, is, uh, is electrical. So I want to talk about electrical diagrams here and show you some of the things of considerations of what you're looking at with electrical. So you've done an electrical plan or you've looked at an electrical plan, you need to know kind of what that, what that means. And you'll see one um, that kind of has lines like this and it designates between can lights, zoom in here a little bit, between can lights and fan lights and vents. And you'll see like this switch, it'll show you the switch is going to these four can lights. And that's kind of just showing the electrician how he's gonna do that. Okay, you'll see this little electrical diagram here. That means there's just a, a, an outlet there or a plug. And then sometimes you'll see something that may have a three-way and it'll have a diagram. Uh, I've got another one up here. There we go. So you'll see a fan here, um, or actually this hallway, excuse me, you'll see this is a three-way switch. So you don't have to walk down the hall to turn that on. So you'll see a switch which indicate on either side. But that is something when you're doing walkthroughs with buyers, um, if you're doing a walkthrough at frame stage to choose where the electrical goes, sometimes the architects don't put together an electrical plan and the electrical rough in is on, on site with a walkthrough with the buyer. And you literally take a Sharpie and you're gonna write an S on the wall or they're gonna write um, this electrical symbol, which is a circle with two lines through it. And that would be where you'd want to, so let's say, have can lights or plugs and switches. Make sense? Okay. The electrical plan is really important to think through as far as, and I'm, re I'm really picky with it because I want to I want to uh, consider, when I come home, what's the first switch that I want to turn on? What switches do I use the most? Do I need to think of one at the end of the hallway? It is very, very, very difficult to add switches and plugs or lighting to the first floor after the fact, especially on a two-story house. If it has an attic, then it's no problem. You can just go in the attic and drop in another can light. But if you have a second story on it, you are cutting into drywall and drilling between the joists. Make sense? So it's really important to think through do you want a light in this closet? Do we need an extra fan in this bathroom? Do we need a certain chandelier here? Um, something to be mindful of when doing electrical over an island is they typically, if, let's say you want a sconce or a pendant, excuse me, a pendant. Sconces are also very uh, critical with their location. So many times they won't, they'll put the box or they'll know it's gonna be in there, but they need to account that they need to move it based on where the island actually falls. So you'll sometimes like spray paint the floor of where the island is gonna go and mark where they are to put the pendant in the ceiling. But some of that um, has to be done after the, the, the cabinets are set and the island is in. Questions, comments, thoughts about electrical? Just All a right. comment. I, we built a house about nine years ago and I wish I had known this before I went into it, because I'd like a complete redo, do over on all our electrical and lighting here. I did a pretty good job on my last one, but it's because I had been through it a few times and I started early. You don't want to show up at that meeting to do an electrical walk and not have thought this through to looking at a floor plan. But I'm noticing more and more that architects, if you don't pay for it, they're not, and electricians don't really like it, but literally, and electricians should help you because they think enough, like, do we want coach lights outside? These are called coach lights on either side of the garage, but do we want one above the garage door? Or do we want them on either side? On the front door, do we want one on one side? Do we want one on both sides? In the bathroom, do you want the, do you want the electrical fixture 
for the meter. Do you want two sconces left and right? The dining fixture, this is a tough one. Where is the dining room table gonna go to make sure that that dining chandelier is hanging perfectly over your table? It's sometimes not always centered up exactly in the dining room, okay? So uh, I will see a builder sometimes, uh, one of my builders does a great thing I love. He takes about six feet of wire and he spins, he, he just puts it in a spool and leaves it in the, in the um, rafters in the dining room. And therefore, uh, it's tied to a switch. And that builder, or excuse me, that buyer, after they close and they decide where they're going to put their table, can go in and, and when they turn the switch on, they can, um, an electrician can, can tone for it, as they call it, and find the wire. And then they have enough wire in there to put it where they want it. It's a nice trick. Nice, nice trick. All right. Questions on, um, questions on, oh, well, something I'll mention on electrical uh, that I get a common, uh, common questions. A GFCI, a ground uh, fault circuit interrupt. Um, a GFCI plug, and I didn't put a diagram to this or a link to this, but I, but I will so you can see the difference. A GFCI plug is typically used in wet locations. And you'll see that it sometimes has buttons in the middle of it, all right? Sometimes they're black and, uh, black and red, all white. Uh, they don't always control just that switch, okay? But what they do is this allows for this to get the breaker, if it was to sense that there was faulty wiring or too much load on the circuit, that it's gonna trip the plug versus trip your breaker and make you go to your breaker box. That is all, all these do, okay? A breaker panel in your electrical box helps you from shorting out your entire house. A GFCI, or you'll hear it sometimes called a GFI, is just giving another layer of protection and a place to reset versus going to the breaker panel. Make sense? All right, wonderful. Question, any more questions on electric? All right, let's talk about plumbing. So some of the concerns or considerations you're gonna have, and you'll see I have in here a list at the end here of all the things that you may need to consider in each room in making selections. So some of the things with respect to plumbing that you had already, that you need to um, consider as far as rough-ins is obviously anywhere that you're gonna want water. And you need to under, consider water, uh, hot and cold water. It's popular in luxury homes to have a hot and cold water connection for a hose in the garage. Because a lot of times, let's say, if you're in a luxury home and you actually did wash your car, people might want warm water to do that in the winter. Uh, you'd also need warm water if you were going to have, let's say, a, a sink basin in the garage for, let's say, you know, just like a workshop sink, things like that. Be mindful of where they are placing the, um, the hose bibs on the floor plan, okay? So let me go back here. Where's my, where's my board? Um, where you're going to place, sorry, where you're going to place the hose bib. Sometimes you'll see they get cheap on you and they'll only put it on, uh, they'll put one location on the side of the house. <laughs> so they figure it's on the side of the house, then it supports the front and the rear of the house. Be mindful and ask, make sure they're putting it in the front and the rear and where you may want it. You know, there's so much opportunity for you to have influence on selections and where things go that, um, it's, it's really a chance to try to think all these things through, okay? The other thing with respect to plumbing and where it goes is to consider if you would want your faucets to come out of the wall. Some people, the, it's fancy to now have the faucets come out of the wall versus out of the sink, and therefore that plumbing needs to be and the rough-ins need to be done differently. Other things that you'll have to 
consider at the time of rough in when it comes to plumbing is um, is what valves you're going to use. So um, when using when choosing plumbing, um, like in a shower valve, let me go back to my 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 notes here. In coming back to bathtubs and shower units, you have to decide: Am I going to go with Moen or Kohler or who's it going to be? So that they have to, you have to supply that valve because the valve is actually put in the wall at rough end stage. Okay, plumbing when it's run, you'll typically see that it uh, there's red and blue pipes, and they're using uh, what's considered called PEX. They don't use copper or galvanized as much more. It's a plastic-based plumbing system. It's cheaper and easier to run. Okay. All right. Once the, uh, once some rough insert done here, and your HVAC will also run their, their duct work, but another consideration that's really important is at this next stage is insulation. And Insulation, well, everything you need to know about insulation uh, is typically considered or evaluated based on what they call R values. And R values tell you it's uh, insulary uh, capabilities. Now, there's some different types of insulation you'll hear called bats and rolls. Uh, bat insulation typically comes in rolls and you'll see it's, it uh, has some different R values here. It's typically what you'll see used in the walls and in the attic. All right. Uh, it's, a lot of times it's being made of recycled material. It has fiberglass, so it's dangerous to work with. It's very scratchy, um, but this is stuff that's most commonly used in our area. An upgrade to that would be spray foam. And spray foam kind of goes in like this, spray it down, you'll see this already has the electrical wire running through it. They spray it and then it expands and they take a big razor and they cut it between. Now the advantages of spray foam or cellular is that it's, um, is that it covers obviously all cracks, crevices, and it has the highest R value compared to uh, of any insulation. The difficulty is if you were gonna come in and let's say we wanted to add a switch or a plug right here, we need to go in the crawl space and drill a hole up through here. Chasing the wire up through foam is very, very difficult. Versus here, this is just kind of fluffy fiberglass, we can just, thread the wire right through it. So you need to be a lot more meticulous about your locations of all electrical if you're gonna be using spray foam. You do not have to use spray foam in the walls. You'll most commonly see it used in the, in the rafters, in the attic, because that, that is where the most heat uh, tends to come into the home, is through the roof, the, the dark roof, and that heat coming in there, and spray foam works best for that. So you may consider just using it in your in your attic or on your roof. Another option is blown in insulation. And blown in insulation uh, is basically if you ripped up a bunch of newspapers and combined it with lint from your pocket, uh, that's what blown insulation looks like. And you'll see that utilized in doing the, uh, the floor of the roof, or excuse me, the, the, the decking of the attic, the decking of the attic. And they blow it in and it has, um, it's typically the thicker that it is, the higher the R value. And over time, it can settle and reduce. So blown in insulation, you'll see it the most common for, uh, for the attic floor. And then foam board or rigid foam panels, you'll see this. We don't see this as much here, but the a best application for this would be um, in the floor, underneath the floor, because you'll see sometimes people use this bat insulation in the crawl space, but the challenge with that is, is that this material can retain moisture. And so if there's a lot of humidity in the air, it can suck into the fiberglass insulation and kind of get, uh, can grow mold. So the solid foam boards is best to use in a crawl space. The last thing used is what's called a reflectant or radiant barrier. Um, in the decking of the house, which in our framing diagram here, uh, in the roof trusses, after the truss, you'll put on more decking. And decking, just think of like we talked about plywood, okay? It typically comes in four by eight sheets, and they put this on the, the roof trusses before they put the shingles on. And that material typically is plywood or a material like that, and it 
has what looks like aluminum foil on one side, okay? That aluminum foil is what's called a radiant barrier. That's just another thing of when that heat comes through those roof shingles, it hits that, that uh, radiant barrier or aluminum foil. You can see it called there, right? And that helps, it helps reflect that heat off. Let's see if the sun's beating down. So it really, it's a, it's a very inexpensive addition to roof decking. I, if you ever have the option, do not bypass getting a radiant barrier, or reflective barrier on your roof decking. Questions about insulation. All right, Leslie, you got your new hair did? Red to go? You don't have to answer, I know you're driving. Be safe. We're glad you're on the call. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see here. After insulation um, is when, right before insulation, I'll mention this at this time, is, uh, is when I would consider doing an inspection. Okay, if you're doing new construction, I would get a home inspection at this, at this stage because it's the last chance that your inspector is going to have to look at things before things are covered up by insulation and then drywall, okay? So I would recommend a two-stage home inspection when purchasing new construction. And this would be the stage you want to do it is after rough-ins. Make sense? Okay. Everybody knows the type of different types of insulation. Then we move to drywall, and um, the drywall is hung and taped. I'll tell you a secret, working with new construction, is to ask your builder, is the drywall and the paint crew the same Pearson? Why do you think it's important that the drywall installers and the paint crew are the same people? Who knows, who knows? Ann Nelson, any ideas? Yeah, I just typed it. It's so the, it's so the drywallers don't make a whole lot of mistakes that they leave for the painters to fix. If you're painting, then you're gonna do a good job on the drywall, so your paint job's easier. That's exactly right. I apologize, my, uh, my gallery view was covered up by chat. That is exactly correct, because what happens is, is one party's pointing at the other as to why the walls don't look good. <laughs> and so it is key to have the same people that install the drywall, because they put it up in four by eight sheets, and then they have to mud the seams and sand it to make it look like it's perfectly smooth. And it's very difficult to see the imperfections and except in different lighting. And so if you're going to inspect the, that situation before the drywall, uh, before the paint goes up, bring you a good flashlight or a floodlight and look at it in different sunlights because it makes a big difference. The paint painters a lot of times are very frustrated with the drywall crew because they did not give them a smooth surface in which to paint. And that's really their job. So it's really important to have the same person doing that if you can. I will tell you a new construction, you will see flat paint is the most popular. And I've had buyers fight with the builder on being able to upgrade or change or utilize a different paint finish because um, flat paint is, uh, I would say, stains very easily. So using it in a kitchen or a bathroom or a potential wet area or where people are touching the walls, it is a mess. However, builders use it because it hides the most imperfections in drywall quality. It hides it significantly. A gloss, the glossier the finish, the more imperfection you're going to see. All right, the other thing is flat paint tends to soak up moisture. So you typically don't see flat paint used on exterior applications. Um, knowing the difference, there's so many different types of 
the paint quality out there, paint's got quite expensive. So um, understand your sheens and finishes. It's, it's, uh, there's a lot more compared to the days when it was just flat eggshell and semi-gloss and gloss. So there are so many finish types now um, to be considered when you're choosing that. Another thing to consider is texturing of the ceiling. So um, you'll hear sometimes in, in what we would consider maybe a lower price point, you would have a textured ceiling or a popcorn ceiling. They do those, it is not for decorative purposes, they do those because it's the cheapest way to cover up imperfections in a ceiling. And the ceilings are the most difficult to, to sand and get smooth compared to a wall, working on a wall surface. Make sense? So recognize that popcorn and, and um, you'll hear it sometimes called knockdown finish or a textured ceiling is simply done because it hides the most imperfections. Okay, exterior finishes. Choosing what type of, um, back to my, uh, of exterior finishes sometimes has to do with cost, preference, and, and durability. So. Typically, the cheapest exterior siding you can put on is vinyl siding, all right? And you can see the cost is, is much, much more minimal. The beauty of vinyl siding, though, is its durability. Um, it doesn't do too well against, uh, against um, uh, hail, <laughs> but other than that, it, uh, you don't have to paint it. A good car washing every couple of years and that it's good to go. If somebody's getting a vinyl siding home, I would recommend you ask the builder for extra panels because it's likely gonna go out of stock or out of color and uh, um, you're gonna want that if you ever have damage to your home. Uh, so that's a, a popular siding material. Aluminum siding, we saw more mid-century uh, homes. We don't see that used as much anymore in our area. We don't really see steel siding. We see a lot of fiber cement or what you might hear called hardy board, which is a brand name. Uh, it's heavy, flexible, but brittle. Uh, it has a, like heat and rot and ultraviolet radiation. So it's a really good, um, it's resistant to those things. So it's really good material besides, uh, it's kind of the second preferred material besides brick or stone as far as its capabilities. However, you do have to paint it. Its life expectancy is, is long, longer than vinyl, um, but you do have to paint it every five to 10 years. So there's more maintenance with fiber cement or hardy board than there are with, uh, with vinyl siding or, or brick. We don't do too much with log siding. Um, you know, the, some of the challenges with log siding, I mean, you get a good look. It can withstand earthquakes and tremors and those things. Um, but it cannot withstand hurricanes and tornadoes. So I think that's one of the reasons we don't see that as much here. We don't see as much clapboard siding, but it has a very cool look to it. You'll see it used kind of in, in with cedar application and redwood. This is a very expensive uh, type of siding material. So you'll see it used as, a, as an accent um, or a, um, uh, for just sort of some decorative uh, areas. And then of course we see sometimes concrete block or brick. Uh, there's some decorative ways to use concrete block in poured wall construction. So um, actually my parents live in a home that has poured concrete walls on its first level because we're in an area off the river and it, it, in 2010 it flooded. And so poured wall constructions are where they basically put forms up and they're gonna dump concrete in the middle of it. And it creates a very stable stone or excuse me, a uh, wall material, which then you could put brick veneer on it or stone or stucco. Make sense? Okay. Where are we in our process here? Interior fixtures, exterior fixtures. So we're getting to, like I said, we're in painting and then we're installing, uh, we're finishing interior trim and exterior walkways and driveways. So considerations there are concrete and what your finish of concrete was gonna be. If it's gonna be a broom finish, which you might see the most, it's just kind of got a light surface to help uh, uh, reduce slipping. 
Um, or you could do stamped concrete, stained concrete, or aggregate. Exposed aggregate is the little bit. Um, and there's links in a lot of this. I just didn't have, there is so much to cover. I just wanted to give a, an hour highlight of all the things and some of the terms. So just know you have considerations as far as your finish on, on your walkways. I also like if you're buying new construction before you move in, have your garage floor painted, painted with epoxy. You'll never get the chance to have nothing on your garage floor to do that again. Then we move into installing hard surfaces, flooring countertops, and completing the exterior grading. They bring in extra dirt uh, to, to start before they're gonna do landscaping, which is the last piece. But in now they're gonna start installing ceramic tile, vinyl, wood flooring, countertops. And there's no list here. You can see you've got a lot of choices with interior finishes, natural stone floors, marble, granite, slate, sandstone, limestone. Carpets, we don't see as popular, but remember, understand carpet is not cheap. Patterned carpet's the most popular in the carpet choices right now, but you're still gonna be, you know, $8 plus per square foot. And, um, you know, you can get hardwood floors somewhere in the range of, of carpets in some situations. The pattern you're seeing up here is called herringbone. So if you ever see this zigzag pattern, it's called a herringbone um, installation but recognize there's different ways in which flooring could be laid. It does sometimes have influence based on which way the floor joists are going. Okay. Um, engineered hardwood floors. So the advantage to engineered floors versus hardwood floors that are sanded and finished on site is that you can replace a board without refinishing the whole area. Okay, if this was, and this is not here, this is an engineered floor up here, which gives you a lot more exotic uh, tones in here. But if not, if you had a stain that happened right here or water that sat, you would have to sand and refinish the entire floor um, to get a, 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 a uniform finish again. We're hearing things called luxury vinyl tiles now. It's just a nicer vinyl floor. It's got texture to it. So that's very popular. We don't see much mo use of mosaics or terrazzos. Uh, tiles, very popular, ceramic and porcelain tiles. Uh, we, don't, we don't see much in alternatives for roof coverings here, but clay roof tiles, one of the most expensive, that and slate. Uh, that and slate uh, are the most expensive we see. We don't see wood roof tiles here. We used to have that in California, um, which was interesting because you want to put wood on a roof that burns really easy. The most popular we see here is asphalt shingles. Um, you'll hear sometimes called composite shingles and metal roofs. And metal roofs are more expensive, um, but they're a lot more durable. Typically, I see them, I mean, as you can see here, a galvanized steel roof, we're talking, you know, 10 times the cost. 10 times the cost to put a metal roof on. But aesthetically, you know, people like the look of that. Questions on roof. The roof, the roof is on fire. All right. After hard surfaces go in, then we're going to start seeing mechanical trims. You're going to see trim outs, such light fixtures, outlets, and switches are installed. Another thing to consider when doing switches, do you want a decor switch or a rocker switch? It's the bigger switch versus the old school. Uh, mirrors. I'm really picky about mirrors, so you may not want to have a frameless mirror stuck to your wall you might want to do something that's more aftermarket and personalized so a tip that i recommend when people are buying new construction is put in the special stipulations that the builder does not install frameless glass mirrors get a credit for it and um, install your own mirrors and then um, shower doors a lot of different choices on shower doors as far as frameless and frame a lot more expensive for a frameless shower door, but know the difference uh, in, in um, that's a consideration. Same things in sinks and toilets and faucets. I mean, if you're gonna get a two button toilet, do you want soft closed toilet seats? Do you want bidets now are, are uh, important? I also uh, wanna mention in mechanicals with respect to plumbing is hot water heating. Um, in your hot water heating, obviously you have tankless is the most popular, the most efficient, and highest quality would be a gas tankless water heater. Second would be electric tankless. 
You don't see them very much because they put they take a lot of electricity and sometimes when you turn your hot water on it may dim your lights a little bit. So tankless electric and then you would go into tank. So you'd have a full tank. They range from 30, 40, 50, 80 gallon. They can put them in tandem. Um, you even can, uh, let's see here, turn that off. You can put tank water heaters in tandem. So if you need more than one, sometimes larger homes will have two tanks and they'll put them in tandem. Some considerations with water heaters is what's called a recirculating pump. A recirculating pump allows the water heater to keep hot water in the hot water lines. So it's basically recirculating hot water through those water lines so that you would have essentially instant hot water. You don't have to wait in the shower for it to get warm for the water from the tank, wherever that's located, typically in the garage, to get to the shower, okay? That's a recirculating pump. They're not very expensive, but what you should consider is what's the cost to run the electricity to recirculate, to run the recirculating pump versus the cost of wasting the water to get it hot to your shower. And most people turn their shower on and get undressed and by the time they're ready to get in the shower. So don't realize, don't think that instant hot water um, maybe is, uh, it's not necessarily a money saver because in our area, water is cheaper than electricity. But it's a personal consideration as to whether you might want um, whether you might want to have a recirculating pump if you have a tanked water heater. They even can do it on tankless, but it's uh, it's a little more a little more involved. All right. Last thing would be landscaping that goes in. Um, so they're going to deliver landscaping. You want to consider whether you're going to have sod or seed and straw. And so sod is a lot more expensive. You would also want to plan if you're going to have irrigation and sprinklers. Definitely something to plan in advance. You don't have to plan for exterior lighting unless, um, because that can easily be added afterwards, but it's a nice thing to consider, especially if you want to put lighting, let's say, on your rear fence. It's a good time before they put the grass in to run that trench and uh, put your lighting uh, in if you have it in a remote location. And then after uh, landscaping goes in, you'll do your final walk. And at that time, I would do final inspection. Yowza. Building a house in one hour or less. I know that was a lot. I know there was uh, <laughs> kind of rapid fire, but uh, uh, are, there any, uh, are, there any other, are there any questions or comments or things to share or just uh, general tips? No? Hey Ted, right. can yeah. you can you just talk generally about some of the most important um, contract considerations to write in for new construction? Yes. yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to do an entire class on um, on new construction um, contract considerations, but I'll give you some of my um, I'll give you some of my my most important ones that I, I want to account for. Let me pull those up here real quick again. Appreciate everyone's patience. I've got a lot of, I've got a lot of notes going on here today. So. I know you always say don't mess with the price for comps reasons and all that. But aside from that, I know there are lots of other considerations. Yes. There are. I'll show you. Um, let's see here. All right. So I have notes under selling new construction and some of the considerations that that uh, that that I write in. Some of the things that I want to know from the agent is like. Um, do you have a site plan or document that shows the distance between the two homes once they're complete? Um, configuration for the driveways, uh, how is that going to look? I want to get as much detail as I can because a lot of times I, I see a new construction that, that just isn't accounted for. There's just this, 
kind of good faith that everything that, oh, that, like, other than everybody picks their tile and their brick color. <laughs> Excuse me. One more. <laughs> okay. Um, but that there's so many more things to, to consider. So in that contract, I want to make sure that I'm writing in there of what selections we get to choose. Um, so depending on what type of contract they use, you know, many times it's a builder contract and in the builder contract, they don't really allow for changes and it's, they don't really have a section for special stipulations. Don't be hesitant to include an addendum, but always talk to the on-site agent about what is, what changes, I love the question, what are the most popular upgrades and changes you've seen in this community? You know, but they're not going to offer those things to you. But when asked, I find they're very uh, free to share. They're like, oh, well, in this floor plan, you should definitely add a blank here. You should add a, a, a hose spigot here. You should upgrade the insulation here. You should do this. They've seen the, the, the good and the bad of, of each floor plan within a community, typically. So befriend that on-site agent or listing agent and ask them, if you're doing an infill lot, which is more popular, go on the Village Facebook and other Facebook groups and ask if people have experience working with that builder and what issues they ran into or what considerations would be helpful. I do suggest when writing new construction contract, um, as with most contracts, keep the price as high as possible. You're only hurting yourself by discounting the price. Negotiate based on inclusions, such as uh, you could ask for um, blinds. Typically you need blinds, you need a fence, you need appliances, you might need closing costs, upgrades, and then other things that I, I like to include are if there's an association prepaid dues or transfer fees. Those are other ways to get money uh, off of the price, but it doesn't take it off of the closing price. That's just saving you cash out of pocket rather than taking it off the price they're going to pay towards things that the buyer would have to pay out of pocket. The other things I think are important in negotiating new construction is that you include a two-stage uh, inspection process so that they're not, and that they're, and that they, that they fix the items found in that. They many times won't agree, but at least get the inspection um, and ask that to be negotiated or have that be known at the front end. You're never going to typically get them to nail down a build time. So uh, people that get mad that their builder is delayed or they've been staying in a hotel room, all the contracts don't are, are built in there for plenty of extensions. So don't plan on being able to get any recourse on that. I, I see people want that, but that... Um, just plan there's going to be delays. Um, in new construction, sometimes I, I use language like this that says uh, contract attention upon buyer's ability to qualify our loan with a preferred lender. All earnest money be returned to the buyer um, if the loan is not approved. And the other is to conduct a generate a punch list no later than five days prior to closing. So this isn't my home inspector. This is a, what's considered a cosmetic or a blue tape walk. And that's to cover cosmetic items. Can you, uh, let's see here. Yeah, you can see that here, right? Yep. And then seller to satisfy 10 day notice of completion prior to buying being expected to close. This is another big in new construction. The notice of completion. This is required that, um, Basically, if people, all those contractors that did work for that builder have to deliver a notice of completion that basically says that they have been paid and the home is free of any liens or encumbrances. And that is important because a lot of times the mortgage lender will hold up the closing until that is delivered because they don't want a lien to go on their property they're giving a mortgage on that because the painter didn't get paid. So be mindful of the notice of completion. This is another term that I will sometimes put in special stipulations based on if, uh, like I said, that there's issues 
there or sometimes the lenders does does not require it okay other questions that i give to listing agents um, on new, new constructions have you had offer who's the builder what's your target completion can you send a copy of the disclosures send a list of items in the home that still need to be completed with their corresponding rooms can you send me model numbers for the appliances going into the home? Because they'll say we include stainless appliances. Well, what, what does that mean? Are the finishes the buyer still has the ability to choose? What flooring is going in the rooms? Can you send a list of the room and the type of flooring going in each? And not just the type, but how is it being laid? Tile can be laid in so many different ways and you'll want to go through a tile layout for the showers and the floors. Herringbone patterns, subway lays, vertical lays, and grout color. Don't assume that they're going to pick the grout that you want. It's popular to maybe have white tile with dark gray grout. Other times, I mean, it just, in the past, everybody just let the builder do these things. Um, and it is something of consideration. There's no cost for different grout color. Um, can the buyer choose the stain for the hardwood floors? Darker stains uh, look beautiful, but they show a lot more dirt. The other thing is on top of the stain is what type of polyurethane finish. Again, another thing that most people don't think or account for, but there's choices. Satin, matte, or gloss. Gloss looks the best, but shows the most stuff. So what do you think the builders choose? Matte. I would always choose typically a semi-gloss. I think mean, it's kind of a good medium. What are the specs of the heating and AC? Who's the manufacturer? What is the sear rating? And the sear rating, the higher the sear, the more efficient they are. They start at a 14 sear. What are the specs of the water heater? Is this a builder owned home or an investor owned home? Sometimes there may be an investor involved. Don't assume that the builder is building that home and he owns the house. There's investors all over town that are essentially the people that put up the money that, uh, that that are building that house and may have influence over the selections. And so, you know, if money gets tight on a job, that investor might say, oh, we're gonna, we might, uh, we might use a different material, okay? So be careful when buying pre-completion. Thank you for that question, Ann. I know I wanted to cover those things, but we got tight on time and I am gonna do a full class on that. That was awesome, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions or comments on new construction and understanding materials? One other thing, I guess, as I look out my window here that I did cover was windows, single and double hung and fixed. So a double hung window means it come, the top pane can come down and the bottom can go up. That's double hung. A single hung window, the bottom, show you here. I have what's considered a single hung window, okay? The bottom sash goes up, the top sash is fixed. Completely fixed window, nothing opens or closes. A double hung would be this top section, I could pull that down. Double hung windows, more expensive, they're great for cleaning, um, but uh, again, more expensive. Also nice if you have uh, the, the gas, windows have argon gas in between them to help their energy efficiency. They typically are double pane. That's the most common windows these days, the vinyl window. Um, is Let's say that that seal fails over time and you'll get fogging in the window. You can just replace a sash versus replacing the whole window. All right. Okie dokie. Well, I'm getting ready to do a test, uh, a test with David Payne with him for next Tuesday after the sales meeting at 1030. At 10.30? Yes, at 10.30 uh, will be David Payne's class on architecture and style. So I encourage you to tune in for that. So have a great day. Appreciate it. And all the notes for this are in the, uh, in the drive. And I will share that on Facebook. So you'll have access to that there. Take care. Have a great day. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you all. Thanks. Have a good day. Yep. Bye-bye.